Okay, at this time we're going to have our special music by Nastasia Chabu. Amen. 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 Thank you, Nastasia, for that song of uh, meditation. We, uh, at this point, will go into our message for the hour, and we have a uh, guest speaker for today who is going to be coming before us for the first time. And so uh, we pray that the Lord will bless him as he brings the message. Thank you again, Nastasia, for that beautiful piece of music. Thank you for using your talents in the service of the Lord. Um, if you guys will join me one more time for prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the Sabbath day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your spirit. We ask that your spirit will be present amongst us, um, even as I speak. Lord. I pray that you would speak through me, Lord, but that I would be hidden behind your cross, that it would be your words spoken, and hearts would be moved by the power of your spirit. Help us all to use our talents in your service. In Jesus' name. My wife is going to be my timekeeper. Um, she's heard this a couple of times, and I have a tendency to speak very quickly. So she's going to help me out with volume, uh, pace, all of that. Um, so you can hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yes. Right, can you hear my knees knocking or my heart beating? <laughs> all right, we're good uh, when Cho, Joe and um, Tim invited me to speak, um, they don't know that I had been in prayer for a couple of weeks asking the Lord that he would use me as he saw fit. Now, I'll admit I wasn't asking to be put in front of a group of people, but I did say that whatever he, he wanted me to do, I'd be willing by his grace to do it. Um, so I want to thank him again for the opportunity um, to speak. Um, I also asked the Lord for something when I agreed to speak. I asked that he would teach me something that I needed to hear first, and that I would share when he taught me with others. Some of you know that I have a tendency when I read something in the Bible or in the spirit of prophecy, if I come across a really good sermon, my first reaction is so-and-so really needs
needs to hear this. <laughs> and while it's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to share what the Lord has, has revealed to you with others, we have to be willing to hear first, I believe. Amen. So, um, as I began to pray about topics, ideas came from everywhere. Um, I, at least can tell you, I had papers, I had notes, sticky notes off the, the dresser, just everywhere, with all kinds of ideas, topics, titles, and yet when I looked at them, they were all about what I thought other people needed to hear. And it's amazing how quickly we, think we can forget um, what we asked the Lord to do for us. So I again asked the Lord to show me what he'd have me discuss, and he made it plain, very plain, in just the past couple weeks. Um, in my meditations as well as in my interactions with others, that there's something I need to understand and something that many of us probably could use a refresher on as well. With that being said, if you will please open your Bibles to Genesis 37. We're going to take a brief look at the life of Joseph. And I want to take a few moments to discuss forgiveness using his experience as a backdrop. Mm -hmm. When you're all there, someone will say amen. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to ask someone to read verses 1 through 4 for us. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto him, his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they had hated him and could not speak peacefully, peacefully, peacefully unto him. Thank you. Um, as I assume most of you already know, Joseph had a good early life. In Patriarchs and Prophets, he's referred to as a petted child. And is described as a person of rare personal beauty, inside and out. He's pure, active, and joyous. He's so favored by his father that his father gives him a coat of many colors. And this, of course, not surprisingly, excites the jealousy of his brothers over the favor that's shown to him. A quick note, adults, parents, please be sure not to pit your children one against the other. Um, in my own experience, when I was a child, I grew up with one of my cousins. We were like brothers. And my grandparents, unwittingly so, pitted us against each other. And when I left the state in which he lived, we didn't speak really for about another 20 years. Um, you know, don't, do that. don't do that to your children. Um, anyway, Ellen White says that Joseph loved to obey God, and that gentleness, fidelity, and truthfulness were, were early manifested in but these qualities didn't come naturally. The Bible says the carnal or natural heart is enmity against God. Joseph had to make a choice to put forth effort to nurture these Christ-like qualities. He had to set his mind to love God and follow him, just as we do. My point is that his brothers had every opportunity to develop these same traits of character, but chose instead to cling to their cherished sin. So as we proceed in chapter 37, it's revealed that Joseph's life takes a turn. Um, it's pretty Daddy. drastic. We know that Joseph had two dreams, Daddy. both of which revealed that his brothers Daddy. and family would be subject to him. As you can imagine, um, this just further increases his unpopularity. <clears throat> in Patriarchs and Prophets, we're again told that he has, as he recounted the dream to his family, Joseph's face was lighted up with the spirit of inspiration, and that his brothers could not withhold their admiration. However, despite the evidence that the message was from God, they refused to be humbled, and they hated Joseph's purity and reproved their own sins. Mm -hmm. So much so that when Joseph is sent to find his brothers, who are way down in Dothan, and finally does so, after a long and arduous journey on foot, their reaction is anything but love. They don't consider his love for them. They don't consider how long he had been searching for them, how tired, hungry, and thirsty he might have been. They instead plot to kill him. 
but Reuben, unwittingly serving as God's instrument of preservation at this crisis, convinces them to throw Joseph in a pit and leave him for dead instead. They agree and cruelly tear his coat from him as they cast him into a pit from which they make sure he won't be able to, to escape. Then Reuben leaves, and the others sit down to eat bread while their little brother cries in vain for help. They begin to feel a little uneasy about what they've done, fearing what will happen should their deeds be found out. But, still thinking of themselves, they believe they've gone too far to turn back. When a band of Ishmaelite traders is spotted, Judah sees a way that he can be rid of Joseph and make a little bit, a little bit of pocket money in the meantime. Um, Satan really doesn't lose an opportunity to, to drive us further into sin. Um, so Joseph is sold to the traders who carry him away to Egypt, and his brothers think they're rid of him. And I'd like to pause in the narrative right here. Uh, we often discuss the experience of Joseph in terms of the grand act of forgiveness at the end, where he reveals himself to his brothers, and everybody you know, goes home in peace. But we're not going to be focusing so much on that today, even though it's one of my favorite moments in Scripture. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to explore is Joseph's resolve not to allow the root of bitterness to spring up in him from the very beginning, and how this led to great blessing for him and for others. By definition, to forgive simply means to cancel a debt that's, that one is owed. If I have a billion dollars and someone fails to pay me back a debt of ten dollars, what do I care? I have, my resources are almost limited, almost unlimited, sorry. But if all I have is ten dollars, and then someone borrows that ten dollars and doesn't give it back, it's a little harder to forgive that debt. Why is that? Oh, you have you have My resources are very limited at that point. It's all I have. On our own, we have very limited emotional resources and are easily, easily injured. Joseph was no different. The Bible doesn't say much about Joseph's response to his brother's betrayal, but we're given some insight from the pen of inspiration. Helen White describes the experience in the following manner, and I'm going to be reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 211. Joseph came on, speaking of when he arrived in Dothan, unsuspicious of danger and glad that the object of his long search was accomplished. But, instead of the expected greeting, he was terrified by the angry and revengeful glances which he met. He was seized and his coat stripped from him. Taunts and threats revealed a deadly purpose. His entreaties were unheeded. He was wholly in the power of those maddened men. Rudely dragging him to a deep pit, they thrust him in. And having made sure that there was no possibility of his escape, they left him there to perish from hunger while they sat down to eat bread. And as um, they decide instead to sell him to the traders, we read, as he saw the merchants, the dreadful truth flashed upon him. To become a slave was a fate more to be feared than death. In an agony of terror, he appealed to one and another of his brothers, but in vain. Stealing their hearts against his entreaties, they delivered him into the hands of the heathen traders. The caravan moved on and soon was lost to view. I chose to read that so we don't get the impression, um, you know, that this was just a minor incident in Joseph's life. This was a huge betrayal. He was deeply injured by the people who he trusted most, the people who were closest to him on this planet. Mm -hmm. And some have said, well, yeah, Joseph was hurt, but. His brothers eventually repented, so that made it easier for him to forgive them. But did everybody who wronged Joseph repent? We're going to review the account of Joseph's experience in Potiphar's house once he's been in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Upon his arrival in Egypt, Joseph is sold to Potiphar and works in his house for ten years. Ten years a slave. Yet the word tells us that the Lord was with Joseph and made all he did to prosper. So much so that Potiphar sees the blessing of the Lord in all he does and commits all into Joseph's hands. Potiphar at this point doesn't have a clue as to what he owns. All he knows is he has bread to eat and a trustworthy man under the blessing of God to look over his affairs. But trouble comes along in the form of Potiphar's faithful, unfaithful wife. Joseph is falsely accused of trying to assault her and wrongfully murders. According to the spirit of prophecy, Potiphar knew Joseph was innocent. And though he didn't kill him, he still cast him in prison just to save face. Mm -hmm. Now Joseph, betrayed yet again, 
finds himself in a dungeon. His years of faithful service to Potiphar cruelly repaid. Not only that, but I want you to consider something that I haven't heard much spoken of. Um, Joseph is not only falsely accused and in prison, but he's labeled as a sex offender. And I don't know how much of you, how many of you have any experience in the prison system or in the prison culture, but you can't get much lower than that. Um, I used to work in a prison. That's a very hard life. You're looking at a very, very, very bad treatment from both COs and from fellow inmates. Um, and in fact, Patriarch's prophet records that he was treated with great severity by the jailers when he first arrived. But, as we read in Genesis 39, 21, we're again told that the Lord is with Joseph. I don't know if it would seem that way to me, but that's what we, we are told and we see that God is indeed with him and has mercy on him, even giving him favor in the eyes of the jailers. To the point that the jailers put him in charge of the jail. Now, John and I go to jail just about every weekend, and I used to work in a prison, like I said. You could be there a thousand years, and you'll never see them give inmates a key. You'll never see them entrust another inmate to an inmate. So we see God truly has to be with this man. Sometime later, Joseph comes across the butler and Daddy. and you know the story. Noticing their distress, Joseph inquires as to what's going on, and they tell him they're disturbed by dreams they've had. They communicate their dreams, and he tells them that the Lord has interpreted the dreams for them. The baker receives a pretty unfavorable interpretation, but the butler is elated at what he hears, and Joseph asks the butler to mention him to Pharaoh when he's free. Three days later, when the butler is reinstated, as foretold, does he mention his new friend? No. He forgets Joseph, and this poor man is left in prison for another two years. But the Lord hasn't forgotten Joseph. After that time, Pharaoh has two dreams of his own, and is troubled at not being able to understand them. Now the butler remembers Joseph, and mentions him to Pharaoh. And from this point on, Joseph's on the come up. He's promoted to second in the entire kingdom, and all affairs are put into his hands. And I purpose, purposefully sped through this part of the story so we can get to the good stuff. Joseph, after patiently waiting until he was in a position of power, finally calls down wrath upon the homes of his oppressors, puts Potiphar and his wife under the prison, has the jailers beaten and throws a butler out on the street. It's only what they deserve, isn't it? Wouldn't you be tempted to do that? I know I would. Think about it. With his recent promotion, Joseph now out, he now outranks and is more favored than Potiphar, his former jailers, and the butler. I don't read anywhere that any of them apologize to Joseph for the grave wrongs they committed against him. Doesn't that justify him in taking revenge? Yeah, we don't read that. What we read instead is that Joseph went about diligently working for the benefit of the nation, and that through him, God was able to save many people alive. So how? How did Joseph overcome what most of us, including myself, would have found to be an overwhelming temptation to get payback? How did he forgive these people? Well, let's go back for a moment. Back to when he's first carted off, he's being carted off to Egypt. We're told in Patriarchs and Prophets again that as Joseph was carried <coughs> to Egypt, he recalled that he had all that he had suffered in the hands of his brothers. As we're all tempted to do, he was recounting the foul words the dirty looks, the evil treatment he had received. I believe this was a pivotal point in Joseph's history. Had he remained in that state of mind, rehearsing the wrongs done to him, he no doubt would have become bitter and resentful. He would have lessened, if not totally ruined, his usefulness in the purposes of God. But instead of this, we're told that his thoughts turned to his father's God and all that his father had told him about his own experience with God. At this point, Joseph is lower than he'd ever been Satan had knocked him down and pretty much ground his feet, his face into the dirt. Slavery, as we read, was considered a fate worse than death. But as we read, God was with him, and just when he needed help, the Holy Spirit gently brought to remembrance what his father had taught him about God. And I want to insert a point here. Parents, don't neglect to tell your kids about God's dealing with you in your own lives. Um, you never know when they're going to need it when they're going to be down and they're going to need to be able to recall the working of God in the lives of someone who they know personally, who they trust and who they love. Um, it was at the most difficult time in his life 
and Joseph resolved to follow God wholeheartedly and unreservedly. We're told he did not brood upon his own wrongs, but forgot his sorrow in trying to lighten the sorrows of others. He chose not to focus on the wrongs he had suffered, but rather on the goodness of God. We're further told that his pride is broken, that up to this time he had been self-sufficient and exacting. But like Isaiah when he when give, excuse me, like Isaiah when he was given a vision of Christ's glory, he sees the flaws in his own character in comparison to the goodness of God and repents. Mm -hmm. He chooses to trust in God's goodness and believe that God must have a purpose in all of this. And I believe God's purpose in all this is summed up in verse 20 of Genesis 50. I'm reading. But as for you, this is Joseph talking to his brothers. But as for you, you thought you were against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. To save much people alive. Joseph came to accept that he did not know it all, but humbled himself before God and trusted his purpose. This is how Joseph was able to overcome bitterness. This is how he was able to forgive the oppressors and betrayers. He looked to God and trusted in his righteous judgment. And this is what we must do. We're going to return to Genesis, but turn with me real quick to Romans 12. We'll be looking at verses 19 and 20. For all of our New Testament Christians out there, to make sure we see the message throughout the word. Here... Well, I'm going to read this actually. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap the fire on his head. Here Paul tells us to give place unto wrath, and that in so doing we shall heap coals of fire upon our enemies' heads. I want us to see that this passage doesn't mean that God longs to burn and punish our enemies. That phrase here, translated as coals of fire, is synonymous with and can also be trans translated as live coals. Where have we read about live coals before? I knew you were going to be the one to answer that. I knew it. Isaiah 6, 6 and 7. I'm going to read this in your hearing. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So what does the live coal being placed upon Isaiah's lips represent? Not burning and punishment? Cleansing and purging. It's for redemptive purposes. This is what we're reading in Romans 12. These live coals are not for us to anxiously wait for our oppressors to finally get theirs. Rather, in forgiving, in praying for, and doing good to those who wrong us, our hope is that perhaps their, con their conscience will be pricked and they'll repent. Amen. In Thayer's Greek lexicon, referring to Romans 12.20 and Proverbs 25.22, from which Paul is here quoting, it says, by the favors you confer on your enemy, the memory in him of the wrong he has done you, which shall paint him as if live coals were heaped on his head, that he may more readily repent. Mm -hmm. In giving place to God, in representing Christ to those who have wronged us, we can, by God's Spirit, win them to the kingdom. This is God's desired outcome. This is his favorite revenge, to take the prey right out of Satan's mouth. I don't recall reading it anywhere, but let's use what I've heard referred to as our sanctified imaginations. And consider with me for a moment, how do you think Potiphar and his house were affected by the forbearance shown them by Joseph? Mm -hmm. How about the jailers and the butler? When he was in a position of power, when he could have executed judgment, when he could have taken out revenge on all those who had caused him injury in the past, he instead chose to cancel the debt. He forgot the hurts and sought out ways to be a blessing to the people and nation who had so recently been his oppressors. And the key word here is forgot. I put, those, I put that word in quotes. 
Did I just make that up for the purposes of this message? Did Joseph actually forget his hearts? Did he let it go? How do we know that? When Joseph was promoted by Pharaoh, he was given a wife and she bore him two sons. Does anyone recall the name of his first son? That was the second one. Manasseh. Manasseh was the first one. And that name is translated, causing to forget. The Bible even tells us that he named his son this because, and I'm quoting, God had caused him to forget all his toil. This word toil is also translated trouble. So did God give Joseph divine amnesia? Let's read, go back to Genesis. We're going to read Genesis 40. If someone will read verses 14 and 15, please. Of Genesis 40. But think on me, for it shall be well with you, and shew kindness, I pray to you, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. Verse 15, For indeed I was stolen away out of, out of the land of the Hebrews, and have also have, and here also have I done nothing that they, that they should put me into the dungeon. Amen. Thank you. Notice that Joseph didn't forget what happened to him or how he had been wronged. God did not give him amnesia. But there's no bitterness in his recount. God gave him the ability to overcome anger and resentment. This is what God did for Joseph, for Joseph and what he wants to do for us. He wants us to be willing to forgive others as he has forgiven us. As we prepare to close, I want to read to you counsel that the Lord brought to my attention as Elise and I were reading Sons and Daughters of God just this past week. This is an excerpt from the Youth Instructor, January 13, 1898. It's entitled, Because He First Loved Us. I encourage you to go home and read the entire thing. For the sake of time, I can't read the whole thing for you. Um, but I am going to read some key points. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. The will of God is expressed in these words in a most decided manner. And the question is, are we obeying the voice of God to the very letter? We can never attain perfection of character if we do not hear the voice of God and obey his counsel. This instruction does not apply simply to those who have had no trials to meet, which would create dislike for their brethren but it applies to those who have been injured. These must not allow hatred to enter the heart or permit unkind feelings to arise when they look upon those who have injured them. Jesus bears the perversity of the children of men and pities them in their own course. He has brought them, he has bought them, sorry, soul and body. And though they give their allegiance to Satan, his bitterest enemy, he loves them still. Let the love of Christ flow into the heart and transform the character. But we shall not be children of God. We shall not be Bible Christians. Christ is nothing to us if we do not permit him to enlighten the understanding, purify the affections, purge the dross from us, and cleanse from our garments every spot and stain, clothing us with his own righteousness. Um, this message was entitled, As We Forgive Our Debtors. As we forgive those who say I'm sorry and those who don't. Those who deserve forgiveness and those who don't. Those who will accept it and those who won't. Is forgiveness for our benefit alone? No. I believe the Lord shows us in his word that the answer is no. We have a distinct message to share with the dying world. A world of debtors. And I believe the counsel we just read reminds us that we cannot live and preach this everlasting gospel. We cannot truly reveal the character of Christ to others while we are stained with hatred and unforgiveness. Ask God for the willingness to pray for those who have hurt us, mm -hmm. or who are hurting us, and who will likely hurt us again. We must forgive our debtors, for our salvation, for their salvation, for God's ultimate and eternal glory. Um, when I found out that the speaker is supposed to choose um, the closing hymn, I had no idea. I asked Elise to help me find one that would be fitting for this message, and I believe the Lord led her to the perfect one. 
but it's one that very few people know. Even she didn't know it. I'm not equipped to teach it to you, but I am going to read it to you because I think yeah. it's perfect. And if you want to read along, it's number 299 in your hymnals. <coughs> Forgive our sins as we forgive, who taught us, Lord, to pray. But you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. How can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart that broods on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart? In blazing light, your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew. How trifling others' debts to us, how great our debt to you. Lord, cleanse the depths within our hearts and bid resentment cease. And by your mercy reconciled, our lives will spread your peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.